Good morning and welcome to Kansas City Oasis. My name is Julie Samuel Wisman and I'm pleased to be here to welcome you this morning for those of us that are here together on the Zoom call, those who might be joining us on our Facebook live stream or maybe you're gonna watch this you know, later this afternoon, maybe you slept in this morning. Uh, either way, we're happy that we get to see you and that you get to see us and that we get to share this time together. Here at Kansas City Oasis, we feel like the human experience is better when it's shared. And we're so pleased that you've taken this time to be with us this morning. We are a secular humanist community that gather around our five values, which are people are more important than beliefs. Reality is known through reason. Meaning comes from making a difference. Human hands solve human problems and be accepting and be accepted. We have a great lineup for you this morning. Uh, our, pre our presenters today, are our musical guest, Pat Nichols. Uh, we'll have a community moment by our very own Amanda Worthington. And our guest speaker this morning is Christina Keller. So without any further ado, I'm gonna stop talking. We're gonna get to listen to some music first thing this morning um, from our, our guest, Pat Nichols. Good morning. All right, well, thanks a lot for having me. I appreciate it. I, uh, this is my third time playing for y'all and uh, First time was over at the, the beautiful Uptown Theater in front of that gorgeous red curtain, so I figured that's kind of about the high point of a lot of times so that was a ball. Uh, this is a tune about taking care of your friends. I'm a Delta Blues, country blues player, and most of those songs are not quite as, I don't know, there's a lot of kind of back and forth about things, and this was a song I really liked. This was by a fellow named Robert Johnson who wrote about how important it is to uh, take care of your friend. Close friends, brother. Your enemies won't do you 
harm. Well, if you got a good friend now, you gotta let him stay right by your side. Well, if you got a good friend, you let him stay right by your side. And give up all your spare time. Love and treat that lady right. said before I played country blues music and uh, back in the day uh, I played mostly stuff from the 20s and 30s um, and those uh, those blues musicians had to be able to play a lot of different genres different kinds of music uh, we think of blues today as sort of a monolithic uh, range of music but when it was in its sort of formative years uh, those folks would be out playing parties sometimes playing all night eight ten hours uh, so people wanted to hear what they heard on the radio. They want to hear variety. And so most of them would be able to play uh, in the ragtime style as well. So uh, I wrote this uh, little piece. It's just a little, a little ragtime thing, which I will play called Black Eagle Rag. fantastic that was so much fun i'm really looking forward to you um in the, in the middle section I, I get a chance to kind of chat with you and hear a little bit more um i love to hear about the history of music and all all things uh musical inspiration so i'm looking forward to chatting with you here just a little bit thank you so much for joining us pat yeah, my pleasure okay so um we have a few announcements this morning um, off the top, I just wanted to uh, let everybody know that we have gotten all of our um, family adoptions. All the gifts have been covered for that, uh, for our, our kiddos' winter wishes for gifts this season. Um, we had um, nine, nine kids that we partnered with uh, Foster Adopt to, to help support, and then 14 more with Operation Breakthrough, a couple of our favorite local organizations here in Kansas City. And so all those were covered. We have already delivered the Foster Adopt gifts. Um, and Sarah and I will be um, working on wrapping up the operation 
breakthrough for for delivery i think uh, monday or tuesday this week so thank you thank you thank you so much to everyone that donated uh gifts or uh, sending cash donations so we could to fulfill all those wishes one of my favorite times of the year i can't i can't deny it i, I broke out my red and black plaid because i'm feeling very festive um today so um another thing that might make you feel festive is a secret santa gift swap so nikki um got that together and they have posted that on the private page if you want to sign up for um the gift swap via elfster there'll be a link there and we have the time frame for that is people can sign up until the 18th and be given their their mystery partner uh, to exchange a gift with and then we would like the gifts to be sent by the 31st. We got started a little late this year, so we'll leave the window open um, through the end of the year. So um, in the next two weeks, you can sign up for that. And then you have a couple weeks to, to get those gifts uh, in the mail to your, to your friend here at Oasis. So that's uh, always a fun time too. I have a couple celebrations to mention. This past week, uh, John Nieder had his birthday on the 3rd. So for those of you that, that maybe could wish him a belated birthday, it's not, it's never too late. It's never too late. Uh, also, Tia Higby's birthday is on this coming Tuesday the 7th. And if you have any celebrations that you'd like us to know about, announce, uh, talk about, we're happy to do so. So please get those into any of our MCs or any of the board members, and we'll share those across. We're going to kind of flip our program around this morning. Our featured speaker has graciously um, consented to come join us ahead of some other plans for this afternoon. And I won't still wonder if she wants to talk about that or if she doesn't, that's fine too. Um, but let me, I'm gonna add you next to me here. Uh, I'd like to introduce at this time, Christina Keller. She is a special education teacher in District 500, Kansas City, Kansas Public Schools, where she works with students at Wyandotte High School. Prior to going into special education, education. She worked as a science teacher in KC, KPS, and Olathe. She's extremely passionate about helping students with differing abilities, and she is currently finishing her master's in special education. And we might get to see a cat. Uh, she was here with, <laughs> she was here with us earlier, uh, before the program started. She, she might make an appearance, so you know I love a good extra cat. Uh, without any further ado, please welcome Christina Keller. All right, um, so when Nikki first asked me to speak, I was kind of um, at a loss just because I was told, speak about something you're an expert in. I'm not really an expert in anything. Um, I am a jack of all trades, master of none. Um, I kind of fit that category. I'm sure if you can see the Zoom chat, you see the conversation going about the goat that I have that lives in my house. Um, I do a lot of different things. And so today I kind of wanted to talk to you about um, how I ended up in education just because it's a second career for me and life doesn't always um, work out quite the way you plan. Um, part of that is I've learned just to kind of go with what happens to me. Um, that's kind of why there's a goat and a sheep that live in my house, why I have horses that live on another farm, um, kind of how I got to where I'm at. So. Um, teaching was really a second career for me. I went to college and got a bachelor's degree in zoology with the intent to become a veterinarian. Um, in 2012, I was working in the field as a vet tech, um, still working on applying to vet school at the time, um, ended up switching jobs to work for a large pet food company that used to be in Kansas City. Um, they have moved their headquarters to Tennessee, and when they moved to Tennessee, I found myself suddenly jobless. Um, as a result of being jobless and having lived paycheck to paycheck for so long, I ended up also finding myself homeless. Um, I spent about six months um, living couch to couch with some friends off the edge of the plaza, um, figuring out how to pull my life back together from, from that point, not having a job not knowing what was next, not where, knowing where I was going, um, not having the family that could support me here at, in Kansas City at the time. Um, I ended up finding myself a job after that six months um, at a veterinary hospital. It was a, the veterinary hospital 
hospital I originally had started at. So I kind of came full circle around. Um, and it was there that I realized that veterinary medicine was not what made me happy. Um, my mother would tell you that the person I am today is entirely different than the person I was um, when I was working in the vet field. I was angry, I was unhappy. Um, and so leaving that vet field was honestly one of the best things I ever could have done. My mother actually is the one who pulled me out of the veterinary field. Um, I walked out of work one day, walked into her house. I went, I don't ever want to go back there. I don't like the me that I am. I don't like the me that they make me or how they make me feel. And so she called me a nondescript sick the next day and I never stepped foot back in that building again. Um, one of the best choices I've ever made. At that point in time, I didn't know why my mom would help me make that decision. Um, and that actually played a big role into how things developed with me as well. Um, during that time frame of my life, both of my parents were involved in meth. Um, so both my dad and my mother were doing meth daily. Um, I wasn't aware that went on for about 10 years with them um, before I finally pulled them out of it. Um, mostly because I sent my mom to a mental hospital. <laughs> um, from there, leaving the vet field, um, I ended up in a series of odd jobs. I work for Kansas City Renaissance Festival. I picked up a job working specifically with the horses at the Joust Company. Um, I started working in a paleo kitchen. Um, so I worked for a company where we made food and delivered it to people's houses. Um, I worked at an aquarium, um, the one actually in Crown Center. And so I spent some time working there um, with children and with children at the Renaissance Festival, when it came to the horses, I do, I do little kids rides. And so I realized, I'm like, this is something that I actually enjoy. And it was those folks in the kitchen that really pushed me to follow that passion and to take a different route. Um, they introduced me to a program at Fort Hayes State um, where I ended up doing their transition to teaching program and got certified to teach science at Sumner Academy. I spent two years at Sumner. Um, I enjoyed my time there, but I discovered while I was there that I'm also not your traditional style of teacher. Um, most of the teachers there had their lesson plans all planned out. They had, um, here's my objectives. Here's the things that I'm gonna do this day. And I was very much, a, I wing it. I go into each day without a plan and that didn't fly so well with my um, department chair. Uh, he hated that I refused to call things the same terms he wanted, um, specifically when I was working with eighth graders. I had an eighth grade science class and I had a biology class there. And he wanted me to call things stuff like dimensional analysis. I'm sorry, but if you tell an eighth grader that they're gonna be doing dimensional analysis, they're going to shut down and you're not gonna get anything from them. Um, but he and I went round and round about that uh, for the two years that I was there. And I decided, okay, maybe this isn't the location for me. Maybe there's another place out there. So I looked. Um, I ended up moving to Olathe North and I taught there for two years. I had a freshman biology class and then I had a college level bio class where my students got dual credit with community college. Um, I was happy there for the most part. I had a little bit more trouble connecting with the students in Olathe. Um, I'm very much a, a KCK kid. I grew up just on the other side of County Line um, in the like lower income section of Johnson County. So these were the KCK kids were the kids that I was really familiar with. My first week as a teacher in Olathe, I had a student walk in and tell me that he had gotten a $400 speeding ticket on the way to school that morning. Like it was nothing. I couldn't fathom that as an adult. I couldn't imagine how a high school kid, a 16 year old could afford to pay double that ticket to get it off of his record. It just wasn't the place for me. I couldn't connect to those kids there. I also couldn't connect to our administration there. Um, our administration there had very old school philosophies. They had very hard line principles that they wanted us to follow. Um, and 
I'm very loose with things. I always want to make sure that the student comes first. Um, and that's one of the stances that I have taken so strongly when it comes to SPED. Um, so I left Olathe um, and came back to KCK. I ended up coming to Wyandotte. Now at the time, um, they weren't able to hire me as a science teacher despite there being a science teacher position open. Um, so I spoke with the principal at Wyandotte and she proposed that I look into special education. Um, and they did have a special education position and she offered it to me there on the spot at that interview. Um, it wasn't something that I was prepared for. I don't think special education is something that anybody honestly could be prepared for. Every day is different. Um, every day is a new challenge, none of it is always the same. Um, and that's something that I think formal schooling like public school doesn't always take into account. There's lots of problems with public school and they're all over the news right now. Um, I feel like every day I can't open Facebook without getting some sort of, here's a problem in education. Um, and honestly, assessment, the way we assess our schools, the way we assess student outcomes is one of those largest problems. Um, we're so focused on making sure that students can take standardized tests, that they'll pass the ACT, that they're going to get into college, that they're going to go into a four-year program, that we've lost the idea that students should come first. If you put students first, if you put the person behind that student, over all of your paperwork, over all of the things that they're wanting us to do that standardized testing, the outcomes will follow. The person should always be the priority. The outcome that they want will eventually get there. It might not get there that year. It might get there three years down the road, but that outcome will eventually get there. And so I've taken a unique approach to how I educate my special education students um, because they are always going to be what comes first. Their interests there are what makes it so that they can learn. Um, one of the things I do every Wednesday, I host a breakout box with my students. So it is a black plastic box and I put up to five locks on it. Each of those locks has a puzzle for the students to solve. Um, I usually will find one that has a theme. So this last week we did the theme of thinking about what you post um, before you post it online, because that's a skill that students need to think about. Um, it teaches students how to work together. So I've got kids who wouldn't have ever communicated with each other who will all move up around the box and they'll share the information with each other. They'll pass papers back and forth to each other as they work together to solve the puzzles. It teaches them those critical thinking skills. Um, so I've got kids who are now specialists in Morse code that had never heard of it before the start of the school year. But now they'll hear Morse code and they can sit there and be like, oh, it says this. Um, so it pulls out skills that students don't necessarily know that they have. And that plays into them learning to work together as well, learning to become part of a team and part of a community because now with each student knowing what they are good at that they didn't quite know before, um, they have developed that community of, okay, this puzzle incorporates this skill. You're really good at this skill. Can you help me with it? So they will ask um, each other for assistance. So that's one of those things that is worlds different from where they used to be. Um, it used to be, that they felt stigmatized. They felt like I need this extra help and that makes me less than the other students. And now my students are friends with each other. They've bonded together. They've learned to work together as a team and they've become their own community within the school. Um, another technique I use with my kids, I do everything in patterns. Um, presenting things in patterns to students really helps them to learn. Um, it shows them how to process the information in a way that they can follow. And that was something I learned as a vet tech. When I was cleaning dog's teeth, 
um, I always did the same pattern. I'd start in the same location, I'd finish in the same location. So that if somebody interrupted me, I knew where to pick up from. I knew where I had left off. And I do the same thing with kids. When we're reading, when we're reading something new, something that might be over their reading abilities, we read it three times. The first time we're literally just reading for content. What is the story about? Can we write a summary? Can we figure out what the big ideas in this piece are? The second and third time we read, we're really reading to deepen their understanding of the content. So we're looking at those deeper facts. Okay, what is the theme of this story? Um, what is the story trying to um, convey to us? What is the overall meaning? And so by presenting it in those chunks, by working in the same pattern each time, students know the first time they're just responsible for what's the story about. And that helps to increase their ability to understand what they're reading and increase their ability to tell you what they're reading. Uh, I've had multiple teachers who've come back and told me, hey, your student was telling me about the story that you read in class. Um, and we're reading things. We read Follow the House of Usher this year with 10th grade students, 10th grade SPED students who are reading at a third grade reading level. Um, I it will be reading with them The Tempest later this year. We take an alternate approach to these texts but they can now tell you what those stories are about, whereas before they wouldn't have had any idea. They wouldn't have been able to understand it. I would have had to find an alternate story for them. Um, a lot of the times I use alternate ways to present things for them. Um, we use a lot of graphic novels. Um, they'll actually really get into the graphic novels because there are those pictures for them. Um, there's ways for them to kind of explore uh, what's going on in that story that are not just, hey, I've got to figure out what this word means on this page. Um, I also let them present to me what they know in different formats as well. Um, I write your standard tests because school expects it. Um, and that's one tradition that I would probably get in trouble for bucking. Um, so I give them traditional tests, but I don't require them to take them as traditional tests. I've got several kids who will sit there and tell me the answers. I have several kids who will turn those answers into an art piece. Um, I give them the option to present what they know, what they have learned to me in multiple different ways, as long as they're giving me the main, the main idea, the main goal that we're looking for. And that's always clearly communicated with them um, we spend a lot of time going over, okay, what is it that we're trying to show? What is the learning that we're trying to get out of this? Um, so just giving kids those alternate ways to think about things um, really helps to get those outcomes that you're looking for. And all three of those methods are putting the kid over that paperwork. Um, I actually have a meeting on Monday because I am standing up for my opinions and my beliefs um, that those students will always come before the paperwork. Um, so if anybody has questions, I'm more than happy to answer. Yes, we, we always have questions. And I usually, it's usually me that starts it, but we've gotten some really great questions in the chat. I have a very curious mind. Um, so I, I guess let's start, I'll, I'll I, I will give myself one question before I get to everybody else's. So what is your, um, so what is the discussion around what could replace things like um, the sort of written, um, written evaluations and, and written testing? Because I know we, we, I mean, I know a lot of people that have test anxiety, have intelligence in various ways, uh, just like you were describing with your students, but um, just cannot, can't test or just don't test well. Um, even if they know the information, what what would you what would you see as like the future of education in a way that we could evaluate without written testing? Um, so UDL is is getting a very strong foothold. It's that uh, universal differentiated learning, and that's that ability for students to be able to present that information in a variety of different ways. Um, my current grad school professor actually took our class and has modified it to let us do UDL, to show us 
how effective that can be. Oh. Uh, so it lets us to look out for, okay, what way do I learn best? What way can I present the information best? As long as you're providing kids with a clear, these are the things I'm looking for. This is what's going to earn you the credit. Uh, most of the time they can follow along with that and present it in a way that is best for them. Yeah. So that's what I would like to see happen. I'd like to see more teachers take that approach and move away from the traditional pen and paper. Fill in this little, yeah, fill in this yeah little. exactly. Yeah. And I think it's interesting that, you know, once you have taken all your standardized tests to get into college, in a lot of ways, it is nothing like what high school prepared you. I mean, you know, you have professors that do all sorts of things that are not necessarily measured by how, how well you can do on that that sort of test so that's why that's why I kind of have I mean I have always agreed with the fact that that doesn't really match what we're trying to prepare kids for if they if they move on to you know um exactly. the end goal is that they know what's going to happen when they get out into the real world and how to handle it right like it doesn't matter that they understand the meaning behind the stories that we read it matters that they know how to do the reading to understand. And get understanding, right, exactly. Okay, so we'll dive into the questions that we see, that I see in the chat here. Uh, first off, how do you work with a child who is labeled um, as, as needing special education, but is also an emerging language learner? Um, I do have several students and a lot of it, a lot of the techniques that we use between SPED and um, ESL students um, really are very similar. Um, so I actually just did my praxis over the summer and got certified as a uh, ESL uh, certified teacher um, because that was something that I was really interested in. I do have a lot of kids where um, Spanish is their first language or we've got kids who speak uh, Swahili. We've got, I think the last count I heard was 52 languages in our building. Wow. Um, so there's, there's quite a few different languages that get spoken in our building. And so um, a lot of those techniques are the same. And those kids also benefit from having patterns and having that um, standardized, like, we're going to do it this way each time for you to practice as you are figuring out how to do it on your own. Mm -hmm. uh, another thing that's very helpful with them um, is uh, TPR, so that's a total physical response, having movement associated with the words that they're learning, um, having movement associated with some of the things that they're doing. Um, I used to have a little like hand game that I would teach my biology kids for how to do Krebs cycle. And it was with their fingers, but it helped them to keep track of where the carbons were in the Krebs cycle. So having those physical responses, having that to connect to what's going on in their brain really helps a lot with the, the language barriers, helps a lot with the, the learning disability barriers. Okay. Well, and that kind of ties into another question about um, the modifications that you use that would also help with uh, quote unquote mainstream kids. So it sounds like, you know, your philosophy around patterns and, you know, using the other, the other skills that people have or the other uh, cues that they, that they mm -hmm. take from. Um, Yep. Sounds like and that. That's kind of your holistic approach to that. Exactly. And main, I work with, I work with all kids. Um, mm -hmm. When I come into other teachers' classrooms, um, because a lot of our sped kids have been stigmatized in the past that they are afraid of being identified as being special education. Mm -hmm. um, I work with everybody when I walk into a classroom. Okay. Um, when kids ask, because I do get asked a lot of times, when are you going to be a real teacher? Like, are you a student teacher? Um, I tell them that I am an educational support specialist. Oh, okay. That doesn't clue them in that I'm there for the special education kids. Right. It lets them know that I'm there to support everybody. Um, and so I do. I support all students across um, the entire school to try to help as many as I possibly can. Um, we do have, and it's funny because a lot of people, and I noticed this in my grad school, a lot of people think that we are over identifying special education students at this point. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of them that aren't being identified though. Um, there's a large number of them that could benefit from some of the accommodations and modifications. And because they haven't been identified as special education, they don't get those in all of their classes. So that's something I've been trying to work with our general education teachers about um, trying to get 
those accommodations and modifications that would benefit everybody, just universal across the board for everybody. Okay, and the, oh man, you're answering the questions before I even ask them because another one I just got was, what's one of the biggest, biggest stigmas you have to deal with when folks find out you work in special education? So uh, you address that. But, um, and, and is there, <clears throat> I was uh, school adjacent at one point in, in my career and is there, um, is there sort of percentages uh, as far as like how many, how many kids are on IEPs at the school that you're at or um, not done that way anymore? If it isn't, that's yeah. fine. It's been a while. With our academy, I know we did some math the other day just because our director came back at us with a response that kind of angered us. Um, she was talking about how she took a kid off my caseload and put them onto another teacher's caseload to make things equitable. Um, but when we came down to it, when we look at numbers um, across the school, and we're split up into academies. So our academy, if we were to divide students evenly, each of us would have 16. That would be our caseload number. I have 18 at the moment. Um, the other teacher has 18, and our third teacher had 12, was what our current count was. Um, so we've got the smaller population and we've broken it down even smaller. Mm -hmm. Just because somebody's on my caseload though, doesn't mean that another teacher isn't willing to work with them. The three of us work very closely as a team um, to try to divide and conquer the classes that have the heaviest caseload. Um, so who, which classes have the most students in them that need our help. And um, we try to make sure that one of us is always in one of those classes to help support that teacher so that they've got that extra body. because. I understand entirely how stressful it can be when you have five kids, miss, miss, I don't understand this. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because that, that is my fifth, sixth hour pretty much daily. Um, it, yeah. Opened up my office kind of as a sped study hall. Oh, okay. And so kids come in and out the whole class period for me. Okay, okay so we have a couple, uh, let's, let's try and get through a couple more before we before we let you go. Um, one is around controversy in education over the common core. Is that still <clears throat> an issue and something that you've encountered? Yeah, so um, I do hear lots of complaints about common core. Um, I actually have a very different opinion on common core than most people, just because I feel like a lot of people don't understand the goal that common core was going for when it was first started. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people talk about math specifically when it comes to Common Core and the, the approach that math takes is different than what most of us traditionally learned um, because I went to school at the same time where we did long division normal before Common Core. Mm -hmm. uh, but I feel like a lot of it is trying to present um, that information in a way that some people's brains work. So I see a lot of these Facebook posts where people are like, solve this math equation or explain how you awesome. solve this math equation. Mm -hmm. And um, it's interesting looking at the different ways that different people do it because some people's brains work that traditional way and some people's way brains follow what Common Core is trying to introduce. Mm -hmm. um, Common Core is kind of taken a little bit of a, a hard stance on all of it. Um, there's been quite a few things recently that have taken some pretty heavy stances when it comes to education. Um, no Child Left Behind put a lot of pressure on a lot of special education teachers um, to try to keep those kids up to where all their peers were when sometimes that's not feasible. Sometimes it's a matter of meeting students where they're at and moving from where they are already at. Right. So, oh, just just one more. That was that was great. That was really helpful. And I think it's I think um, to your point, I think it's I feel like it's changed over time. I know. Um, oh, remember her years ago when I was in school, uh, <laughs> it was very much, you know, sort of the the method where those kids just left for the day and we didn't see them again until they got back on the bus. And it was it was I mean, in my mind, it was just even as a, as a small kid, I thought, oh, that doesn't seem very fair, or very fun or whatever. Um, so I, I've, you know, as, as um, special education has evolved over the years, I think there's a lot more consideration given to 
um, you know, the, the psychological ramifications of, of not having someone just come into a classroom to help, you know, to help give assistance as opposed to, oh, these are, these are this, this group of people. And uh, it's kind of, I would imagine, very isolating. So yep. I'm glad to hear that. Um, we do have somebody asking, we have some, some former Montessori teachers here in, in Kansas City Oasis. Um, the Montessori method, does that um, sort of inform a little bit about your approach to special education kind of? Um, I'm kind familiar of with it. Uh -huh. um, I do use some of the techniques from mm -hmm. it, um, not necessarily even intentionally. Um, a lot of what I try to do is what is common sense to me, what I, I really get to know my students very well. I've got many of them that call me mom because I am now school mom. Oh. Um, and so I try to consider the student as an individual and what's going to be the best for that particular student. Um, and like I said, I do try to get to know all of them very well. I've got one little boy who works really great in a quiet environment. Um, he was struggling in his painting class. So he came into my office. We did his painting. I am not an artist by any stretch of the imagination, but I can watch a YouTube video and figure it out. Mm -hmm. And so we did his painting in my office. And then he went back to his class the next day and did two paintings while he was in there. Um, he stopped fighting that teacher because he needed to know that he enjoyed painting and that it wasn't just like a class to get a grade. Yeah. And so we worked through that. Um, I try to tailor what I'm doing to each individual student um, because honestly, school is something that they should enjoy. Um, it shouldn't be horribly stressful for them. And that's one of my main goals is to take that anxiety and stress that most of them feel about school away mm -hmm. and make it more like, okay, I can do this. I just have to approach it in a different fashion. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah, we're all, yeah, and you know, learning to learn is what will get us through the rest of the rest of whatever. Every day in my job, um, and I think most of us can say the same, we we come across things that were a sign that we're like, ooh, I have no idea how to do this, but let's just put one foot in front of the other. So I think, yeah, learning to learn is great. Thank you, thank you so much, Christina, for taking the time with us this morning. Uh, we really appreciate you coming to see us and, and hopefully we'll we'll cross paths again in the future. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Okay. All right, everyone. So now is the time where we will uh, go into our breakout room so we can, um, I'm going to get, I'm going to get some coffee friends and um, we'll get to, to chat with who's, who's on with us this morning, see how everybody's doing and we'll be back in about 10 minutes. So I'll see you soon.
All right, welcome back everyone. So we're going to now continue our program. Uh, let me find Pat again here. We will grab it. She is my spotlight. Hello, welcome back. Um, just briefly, Pat, before you get started with your next piece, I would like to ask you a couple of questions um, about, do, do, do. oh, we talked a little bit about uh, the blues and how it has evolved and sort of what people think of it as opposed to what it, what it was traditionally. Can you tell me a little bit, oh, you're still on mute, friend. You're, you're, you're on mute. Um, can you tell me a little bit about some of your earliest uh, musical influences? There we go. Uh, yeah, sure. I've been really fortunate over the years to have had a wide variety of musical uh, opportunities that unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, started in high school. I grew up in a small town north of Hayes and um, for some reason, my family decided I should play the clarinet, and um, I. Uh, uh, so, and of course, all the all the other clarinet players were girls, which was not good for me. Uh, and uh, I became I was the worst clarinet player in the band, and so they had me play the alto clarinet, and then finally the bass clarinet, which just plays like one note at a time. <laughs> I, went to band, I went to band camp in Hayes, where you're you know, and I was the worst bass clarinet player in band camp. So uh, as a result, I decided I'd try something different. I went to got a guitar and I have sort of played it as a hobby for years, ever since I was about 19. And I played bluegrass music for a long time, took up the fiddle, mandolin, um, and then uh, came back to acoustic music about 2006 when I moved to Lawrence. A good friend of mine was a professional traveling musician I known as a teenager uh, helped me kind of get associated with being a professional musician and I've been I love this kind of music this music that's sort of the roots of blues um, and um, yeah so I just got started on learning fingerstyle music I, I thought well I, I wanted to go figure out how did the people who play today where did they get their music and then I went back three or four generations and ended up doing this so i've got a i've got a weird stuff on my screen but that's okay i don't care <laughs> so that's it and so um i play a lot uh I, i'm now learning to play the dobro oh, so like you know uh music i'm very lucky because i had these things and now that i'm retired um mostly retired you know i have something that that gives me something to do something i really care about and yeah. kind of a, Sort of a bit of a passion, you could say, I guess. That's great. So we have over um, in the links on the, the chat today, we have your links for uh, where people can reach out to you. They're on Facebook uh, at www.facebook.com slash Pat Nichols Country Blues. And then also on uh, ReverbNation.com, Pat Nichols Country and Delta Blues. So that's a couple of things. And can you talk to us a little bit about um, your CDs that you have? Oh, well, thank you for the opportunity. Sure. Uh, this is a CD I made a few years ago. Uh, it's a solo CD. Uh, it has at least one or two of the songs that I'm going to do today on it. Um, I bought in a, in a burst of uh, uh, enthusiasm, I bought a thousand copies, which uh, many people thought was not smart. <laughs> but I'm down to about a hundred now. Right and on. so um, I'm pretty happy about that. Um, I had some friends uh, uh, who, you know, one, one friend who uh, hired me to go to California and play a show out there, and he gave away under to my CD, so that kind of helped get the number down. Anyway, I'm offering these for sale if anyone is interested. Um, am I still in the breakout room? No, you shouldn't okay. be. We're, we're back in the main room. Yeah. Okay. Uh, anyway, I'm offering it for sale. Uh, mm -hmm. today special you know Christmas really right around the corner folks That's I mean right. you cannot get a better little Jimmy think of the look on little Timmy's face when he opens your package <laughs> from grandma or grandpa for Christmas and he finds a Pat Nichols blue CD blue from the Delta I CD it's a, I tell you it's a Christmas he'll never forget they, speechless is what comes to mind speechless, speechless. and yes. his future therapists uh, <laughs> will, will thank you 
Um, I'm, uh, I, I'm offering this, uh, di uh, it, it, they're $15 a piece, and if you Venmo me or, or PayPal me $15 and your address, I'll send it to you tomorrow, postage paid. If you want to really splurge and get one for all the grandkids, you can buy two of them for $25. <laughs> and the same thing is I'll, I'll, I'll mail them. And this sounds ridiculous to say this, but it's true. I, for as long as I've had this, I've told people, if you're not satisfied, let me know. I'll give you your money back. Oh, yeah. um, and because I've had, I've had a lot of people who ended up buying a cop, couple of copies. No kidding. I saw all kidding aside. And, um, it's, uh, it's just, it's, I, I'm not a person who brags on himself very much, but it's really good. So. Okay. Oh, one of our. Uh, I'm, I listened to it the other day and I realized I was a better guitar player then than I am now. <laughs> It's a little bit embarrassing, but that's just life. You get old, you know. Oh my gosh! So you always have a side. Uh, somebody said a sideline as a salesperson, but I would say maybe you have. You know, we could go on the road with a comedy act too. You and me. Well, uh, that's sweet. That's very kind of you. Uh, <laughs> I, I always, when you're starting to hawk something, you want to try and get get it in people's that's minds. Right. That's right. And it is full color, by the way, in case you didn't notice. It's yeah. full color has a. Uh, as an insert, you know, you open it up, or it's just, it's just, it's everything you could want. Let's see, <laughs> honestly, uh, professionally and, produced. Oh, Jason's trying to get you back on track. Do you have an upcoming uh, live show that people could? Yes, I do. Uh, because of the pandemic, things really shut down. Uh, and then I had surgery to my hand the first week of September. So we're sort of getting back. We did, we have a show at the uh, December 29th at BB's Lawnside Barbecue, uh, which uh, if you like uh, blues music, it's, yep. it's it's the place. And if you just want to see something really unique in Kansas City, yeah. uh, it, it fills the bill. It's an old roadhouse that yes. from back in the 30s that was built on the county line, built on the in the on the state on the line between the city and the county yep. so that they didn't have to follow city alcohol regulations they didn't have to close when all the city bars had to close I love it. So it has been around a long time and uh yeah, and it, I am, it, it, it is something else yeah also good barbecue but yeah blues blues is king there uh, and i'm fortunate to live just down just up the street from from bb so uh, okay i would encourage everybody to head out head out south and and check it out december 29th okay all right with that let's uh let's, i will quit talking and have you take it away all right, well, I'll do another song then. Um. This is a song that many people of a certain age will remember from the from the uh, from the folk music scare back in the '60s. Took me aside to see Joe. You're getting 
is dead. She said that woman that she loved is So roll out that rubber tire buggy. I wanna see your very best hack. I got some young women going out to the graveyard. Only six are coming back. Now when I die, boys, won't you bury me in my box pack suit? Man, I wanna wear my best as and hat. And put an iced up crown medallion on my watch chain So my boys know I died standing pat I want six gamblers to carry my coffin And some chorus girls to sing my song And a jazz band, I want a kick-ass jazz band To raise hell as we roll along I like to say that's the end of my story So let's have another shot of that booze and if anybody asks, you will find me say He had the St. James Infirmary Blues He had the St. James Infirmary Blues Lovely. That was fun. I don't know that I remember that. It was a folk song, huh? Folk, during the folk scare. I love that. The, yes, uh, and actually, I, I mean, the, the history of the song literally goes back to the 1800s in, in a lot of different formats, mm -hmm. and um, it, it's a it, it's original before it got turned into something completely different. It was a um, a folk song uh, in the British Army warning them not to uh, uh, not to um, I can't find a good way to say it. Not to uh, have relations with the yeah. local prostitutes. Avoid BP. Yeah, who would give them <laughs> venereal diseases and they would oh, die. Yeah. So anyway, that's, that's it, it went through many, uh, many changes. That. That, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. All right, Pat, well, we'll look forward to um, the final performance here in just a little bit. Thank you so Thank much. you very much. Thank all of you for your kind words. OK. So with that, we will, like I said, we're kind of working our way some kind of different uh, direction today, but now it's time for our community moment uh, with our very own Amanda Worthington. We, we asked Amanda for three words to describe herself and she said, rigorously honest, writerly and comedic. And then, okay, wait for it. Here's a warning label. Uh, and hopefully Pat's last song doesn't have any of this in it. Uh, I effing hate whistling, so just don't. So Pat, that, that'd be a warning to you. I don't know if you if you regularly whistle with the blues. Uh, but with that, let's turn it over to Amanda. Good morning. I I think you're unmuted, but I can't hear you. Mm -mm, no. Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, I hear something now, but what about now? Yep, there it is. There it okay. is. Okay. I don't you. know what happened, but uh, Zoom, blame yeah. it on me. All right. Um, well, hey, everybody. 
I'm Amanda. Thanks for having me today. Thanks for being with us, Pat. I love your music, as I was saying. Um, I am kind of a latecomer to appreciating blues, um, but I actually made some really great friends in that community. So I love the storytelling element of it. And that really hits on um, kind of what I'm going to do today. So with that, I'm going to just show you what I have today. And um, let me see here. I'm always awful at this. <laughs> Here we go. Okay, um, today I'm gonna talk about just the role that silence plays in um, a lot of problematic behavior and the way that that's, um, the way that that's really impacted me in my life. Um, so we're all pretty much familiar, I think, with the the saying power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And in that saying, we really focus on the words power and absolute power. And I was just sitting around one day and thinking to myself, you know, I think, I think for me, this, this saying needs a little bit of a revamp. And so I changed it a little bit. So my version is silence corrupts and absolute silence corrupts absolutely. And it's this idea that something that corrupts is corrosive. It eats something from the inside out. And I think the thing that does that is silence. So this is just a little thing I came up with. As I said, I am a writer, so I kind of write my own quotes sometimes. This is um, just came to me. Uh, silence is the great reinforcer of tragedy, the glue that binds us to our own trauma and makes us complicit in our own suffering. It's this idea that we keep it all in and that that's, that's like keeping poison in your body instead of releasing that. So growing up, there were a whole list of things that we were told in my household, we just don't talk about. So first among those was the fact that my dad had a gambling addiction. Nobody else needed to know that was a family concern. Second, why do we get nice school clothes when my dad wins at the casino? Or the flip side of that, why do we have to wear clothes from the thrift store when he loses? The fact that my mother had cancer, we were not allowed to talk to that, talk about any that to anybody. We just had to proceed as if none of this had happened, as if none of this was happening to us. The fact that dad often didn't pick my mother up from her chemo appointments because he was out gambling, trying to fix things in his own way and making it so much worse. My brother's underage drinking, my brother was arrested at a Kansas City Royals game and we weren't allowed to talk about this or discuss any of the issues that were underlying this. My mother attempted suicide when I was 17 years old and um, it was a lot. I asked if maybe I could write about this for a project at school and I was told um, very vehemently, no, we don't talk about this. Nobody needs to know about this. I wrote about it anyway, but that's kind of just what I do. Why my aunt Laura moved away. This was a mysterious kind of thing in our, in our, in our childhood where my aunt lived in Kansas City for a very long time and suddenly she moved away to this small town in rural Missouri and we didn't really discuss it. And I think that maybe we should have. My dad, um, as I mentioned, had a gambling addiction. He would steal from my mother and others as it turned out to fuel his addiction. But once again, um, that wasn't a thing we discussed. We as children, my brother and I took turns riding with my dad to make sure he went places like the grocery store instead of the casino. I thought this was a normal thing that kids did. I bonded with my dad for a while on these trips, not realizing what the purpose of them was, but it wasn't a thing that we ever talked about. And finally, my dad was uh, laid off from a job or rather fired from a job for embezzlement. And it was, the story that we got was always that they hated him and didn't treat him fairly, but maybe there is some truth to that. I'll never know the truth, but you know, for sure, but it wasn't a thing that we discussed. And so there were just this whole lot, this whole laundry list of things that, you know, we didn't talk about. So what I'm gonna do today real quick is just, I have a couple of vignettes, these stories that I wanna tell of these people. And I'm just gonna read these to you now. The first one is called, I just wanted to go faster. I gave her the sleeping pills. I'll give you the bottle back when I wake up, she said. I believed her. I wasn't prepared for my father to come barreling into the house, but then he was there, throwing his body against the locked bedroom door. 
There was a trash bag over her head. She was alive, barely, barely counts. I tried to talk to her and she said I just wanted to go faster. I knew just what she meant. I was 17. She went slow instead, by cancer, a whole decade later. I guess even the dying are sometimes robbed of little mercies. The next one is called A Little Grace. She learned of her death with a bag full of candy. They'd waited to tell the kids it was probably the right move. Her aunt had been more like a mom to her and she knew even at eight that things would never be the same. It was Halloween, Halloween night of 2011. Years passed. Her anger with her own ineffectual mother grew. At 15, she tried meth for the first time. By 16, she was pregnant. At 17, she gave her son a sister. They had different fathers and neither one was in the picture. That's just the way it goes sometimes. At least she still had her big brother. He was everything to her. He was there for her children when she wasn't, which is to say that he was there for them the vast majority of the time. This one is called, it's easy to keep a secret when no one asks you how you are. Jimmy was a musician and damn good one too. He played guitar, saxophone, keyboards, whatever he could get his hands on. The guitar but was by far his favorite instrument though, the way it felt strapped across his body, a silent embrace. He knew he was destined for greater things than his job at the local gas station or the factory where most of the men in town were employed. They made the cheese powder that goes on Doritos. That's all he knew. His stepdad hit him sometimes, occasionally he hit him back. You know how it is. He cared too much, that's what it was. That was probably why his niece and nephew took him for their father. He sat with them, made space for them, played action figures with them, taught them about Marvel and Star Wars and other things worth knowing. He loved them, loved them like he could no longer love his girlfriend's boys, not since she had left him in their podunk town and all of it behind. Now in the evenings, he spent his time with a new lover, a fickle lover, more demanding, painful and perfect, administered with a needle wherever he could find a vein but eventually she did him wrong and now he's in the ground instead. His mom knew she kept a secret and put him in a clinic 40 minutes outside of town, but inept mothers seldom save children. And besides, she never asked how he was, only what he could do for her. I think that was her mistake. And finally, thank you for your service. He had a fucked up back from the war, his convoy had hit an IED and the vehicle he was in had landed upside down. It was a miracle that he hadn't been killed. He came home shortly after that and applied for disability and he drank. He wasn't sure who he was when he wasn't dealing with infidels and following the orders he was issued. He had gotten in for the wrong reasons, but I'm not sure there are any right ones. He was a marketing student and a mechanic and later decided he wanted to work on airplanes. Being a combat medic had been messy work. Airplanes didn't beg you, don't let me die. I look up with you with sad orphan eyes. There was that. He had four children by two different women, none of which he saw. He made a lot of wrong turns, but all he had to do to escape any natural consequences was don his uniform. Americans fucking love a man in uniform. Thank you for your service, they'd say. Let me buy you a drink, soldier, someone would offer. Because that's what you do for the people who put their lives on the line. No one asked him how he was either. His mother was dead from cancer, his cousin from heroin, and his best friend had just killed himself. But nobody asked how he was because when you ask, it obligates you to listen. And if you're in the place where you're listening, you might have to hear the truth at some point. So the takeaway here is that there's no sign of, it's no sign of health to be well-adjusted to a sick society. Sick societies cause burnout, stigmatization, intolerance, addiction, abuse, suicidal ideation. These are all things the character in this tragedy know all too well. So how will you remember these stories? We remember the cancer patient and the survivor of a suicide attempt, the heroin addict, the teen mother and meth addict, the gambling addict, the alcoholic. Would you like to learn, would you like to learn their names instead? This is Don. Don is my father. He had a gambling addiction, but he was also a loving grandfather and doing his best in a world without his father, in a world without his wife, in a world where he was never taught things in general and had to learn it all as he went. This is Dana. Dana is my mother. 
Dana died at 48 from cancer. She, she was such a source of inspiration and wisdom for all who knew her. She loved reading and she taught me to love it too. She is the source of everything good in myself. She just was taken from this world before her time, but her memory lives on. This is Grace. Grace is my cousin. Yes, Grace has problems with drugs. Yes, Grace had children out of wedlock. His Grace has made a lot of wrong turns, but Grace also had her mother figure taken from her too, too early in life. Grace was also never shown the right way and lives in a small town where all of these things are kept quiet. This is Jimmy. Jimmy died about a month ago from a heroin overdose. Most of the family did not know that he had any problem at all. His mom kept it a secret. She got him in rehab, his drug, drug dealer got him out. But you know what else Jimmy was? Jimmy was a musician and Jimmy was a wonderful, caring, loving person. He was a father figure. He was resilient. He just found himself stuck in a small town without the resources that he needed to get out. And finally, this is Brad. This is my brother. He's a combat, he was a combat vet or combat medic. He is a veteran. He's trying to get to be an, uh, he's going to school to be a mechanic to work on airplanes. He has goals, he has dreams. This is his uh, little daughter, Leanne. And uh, he's working to have partial custody and I'm just so proud of him. And he is more than the fact that he struggles with alcohol. He is a human being and he is my brother. So how can you help in these situations? And these people fall victim to this silence. Avoid making assumptions, ask. Humanize suffering. They're not just addicts, they're human beings with names. Connect, be kind no matter what. You don't know what somebody's going through. Assume the best of intentions unless you're given a reason to do otherwise. And um, teach emotional intelligence explicitly to children. They need to know how to deal with their emotions and we do not teach that. And finally, normalize asking for help. We all need it sometimes for a community. We don't get there without that help. So the truth is perhaps best expressed in these lyrics from the song Quiet Town by the Killers. This is a song that my significant other heard on the radio and he came on and told me about it because we had not, never expected this kind of depth from the Killers, but um, their new album um, Pressure Machine is just incredible about the small town experience, but it really hit me when I lost my cousin Jimmy. And it goes like this, when we first heard opiates, op when we first heard opioid stories, they were always in whispering tones. Now banners of sorrow mark the front steps of childhood homes. Parents wept through daddy's girl eulogies and merit badge milestones, their daughters and sons, laying there lifeless in their suits and gowns. Somebody has been keeping secrets. Mark Twain once said, the truth may hurt, but silence kills. And one thing I've heard from more than one person, and I like to say on an ongoing basis is that to conquer our demons, we must first name them. They're here with us. If we name them, we come closer to conquering them. We're more alike than we think. Most of us one tragedy away from the streets. So the lesson here is be kind, humanize, and live those oasis values. As we say here, human hands solve human problems. And Meaning comes from making a difference and you don't have to do something big to make a difference. Hold the door for someone, smile at someone, be kind in a world where you can be anything. That's the most important thing you can be. So that's what I have for today. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, Amanda. That was, that was a very, um, that was very powerful. And that was very vulnerable, vulnerable of you to share that with us. And we really appreciate you sharing, um, sharing this uh, piece of your journey with us. So thank you, thank you so much. We're grateful for, for that. It's, it takes a lot of courage sometimes to talk about some very um, heavy and traumatic issues that have affected us through our lives and we, we appreciate your willingness to do that. So thank you. And we're, we're with you here in your community. So thank you so much. Okay, Whew. so with that, we are going to, let me find Pat one more time here. We're gonna add his spotlight here. 
All right. Okay. With that, it just le it's just uh, leaves it for me to remind everyone that Oasis is a 501c3 nonprofit organization that's entirely volunteer staffed and donation funded. Um, you can go to our website, Casey, uh, caseyoasis.org, click on or slash donate and click on the links there to see how you can help support uh, our mission here and um, the way that we that we create a community for secular humanists here in this region. So with that, we will turn it over to Pat uh, for a final performance. All right, well, thank you very much. And I re again, I really appreciate the opportunity to play and, and uh, a real big shout out to, to, that, to the program we just heard. It was just, that was extremely powerful, the statement that um, silence is, uh, is what holds us, keeps us, binds us to our tragedy. And I think that's, you know, amazingly true and why therapy and getting things out can make such a big difference. So, um, kind of, I appreciate the chance to play again, and um, I'm going to end with a song that uh, sort of became, uh, in the blues world, one of the most played songs and jams and stuff. Uh, like that because Eric Clapton did it on a record called Layla back in the, in the 70s and a lot of blues guys picked it up and a lot of rock and roll guys picked it up but it originally the, most, the first famous version was from a guy named Big Bill Brunzi uh, who was a Chicago musician came from Arkansas uh, it's called Key to the Highway and I thought well here, we're leaving so I have a good choice <laughs> to uh to perhaps get the chance to see you in person i just realized that i'm going to be out of town that weekend so i will i will have to stalk you on social media and see see where you're playing so uh thanks pat for joining us we really appreciate it have a good rest of your day thank you okay so 
that's all the t all the program that we have today. We want to thank all of our presenters, Pat Nichols, Christina Keller, and Amanda Worthington, um, for sharing their talents and their stories with us today. Uh, hey, you know, it is really warm outside. Uh, you know, global warming is real, friends. Uh, we've got unseasonably warm weather, so hopefully you get to get out and enjoy it. Maybe look at some lights tonight. That's one of my favorite times about favorite things about the winter uh, season is all the lights. I think that goes back to to childhood. So maybe take some time today, reconnect with a friend, tell someone you're thinking about them, that you care about them, that you're there for them. Uh, and I care for all of you. I'm so happy that I've gotten to be here and host and, and talk with everyone this morning. And I look forward to seeing all of you next time. Thanks so much. See you soon.